Welcome everyone to the first session of the University of Minnesota Extension Meet Your Pollinators webinar series. This is the third year of having our pollinator series and I know the past two years that we've done this we've had really cold and snowy weather. <laughs> so this is a really interesting change going into February in Minnesota. I mean, here it's felt like spring these last few days. So regardless of where you're joining us, if you're in Minnesota or elsewhere, thank you for joining us today. Today is the first session of a three-part series. Elise Bernstein will be giving her presentation on actions to help pollinators. These presentations will be recorded and we'll be emailing those recordings out on Friday, February 2nd. I will also include all the resource links that Elise will be sharing during the presentation, as well as a short evaluation to help us improve our pro programming for the future. So be sure to check your email after Friday. There will even be a chance to win a Visa gift card for those that fill out the evaluation at the end of the series. I'll share more information about that on Thursday, so stay tuned. So before we get started today, I'd like to go over how we can all interact with each other on a Zoom webinar format please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen to ask questions. I'll be asking the speakers questions only from that section. For comments, please use the chat feature. If there is a question that someone else has asked in the Q&A function that are you, you are also interested in as well, you can upvote a question to make sure that I will ask those questions to Elise. So next slide, Elise. I'd like to introduce our fantastic team of extension educators that are making this webinar series possible today. Joining us today is Claire Lacan, an extension educator in Rice and Steel Counties, Shane Bougea, Blue Earth and Lesueur Counties, extension educator, and myself, Tara Young, extension educator in Hubbard County. So along with today's speaker, Elise, we have a great group of incredibly knowledgeable people Claire and Shane have entomology backgrounds, so we call them our bug people on the team. Uh, really, with over 1,200 people registered for this webinar, it truly takes a great team to run it, so I am very appreciative of their help. Now, I am very happy to introduce Elise Bernstein as today's speaker, who will be discussing action steps you can take to support pollinator health and diversity. Elise is an outreach specialist and researcher with the University of Minnesota Bee Squad. Elise oversees the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas Project, a community science-based project aimed at tracking and conserving Minnesota's bumblebees. She also assists in conducting bumblebee research and leads pollinator-centric outreach across the Twin Cities area. Elise holds a Bachelor of Science from the University of Minnesota, where she studied environmental science, policy, and management with a focus in environmental education and communication alongside a minor in public health. We are ready for you. Take it away, Elise. Great, thank you. All right, thanks so much for being here today, everybody. Um, I'm excited to talk through some of these different actions that we can all take to help pollinators. So to start, I like to give a little bit of an overview kind of of what Bee Squad is, um, because we get that question a lot. We go to a lot of events around the Twin Cities and give a lot of different presentations and people are always curious kind of who we are and what our team does. Um, so Bee Squad is a team that is born out of the Bee Research Lab at the University of Minnesota. And you can think of the Bee Lab as sort of like a Venn diagram. Um, on one part, you've got the Spivak Honey Bee Lab, uh, which is run by Dr. Marla Spivak. Uh, so she's got a team of researchers and scientists and graduate students that are researching honeybees. So they're looking at um, viruses and other problems that honeybees are facing. And then on the other side of the Bee Lab, you've got the Caravo Native Bee Lab, which is run by Dr. Dan Caravo. Again, he's got a great team of lots of researchers and graduate students that are looking um, into problems and things that our native bee population in Minnesota is facing, um, looking at floral associations between different bees and plants, uh, distribution of different species and things like that. And then our Bee Squad outreach and education team is kind of that overlap of the Venn diagram. Our mission, our Bee Squad mission statement right now is to help people help bees. So our goal is to kind of be 
um, that vector between the B lab and all the research that's going on and the public. So we're the outreach and education team. Our goal is to talk with people about um, the different kind of things that they can do to help bees and other pollinators. So just like this kind of presentation that I'm giving today. So we'll go through why pollinators are important. We'll talk a little bit about pollinator diversity, um, all the different species we have here in Minnesota and across the US. We'll talk about um, how some different species of pollinators are doing, if they're fine or if they're in decline. And then we'll get really into the meat of this presentation, what I'm sure a lot of you are here for today, which is the four actions to help pollinators. So to start off, why are pollinators important? And uh, it's when you look at it, look at the statistics, um, it kind of makes things a little bit more obvious, but 80% of all plants rely on animals for pollination. Um, so this is including insects um, and some other animals as well. And when we think about how this affects us, this equates to about one in every three bites of food that we take um, is due to an animal pollinator. So pollination um, is the process of essentially sort of fertilizing a flower. Uh, pollen is moved from the anther to the stigma of one flower or from one flower to another, which allows the ovary to develop into a fruit. The ovule of, of that ovary is what becomes the seed. So bees and other pollinators are responsible for helping plants produce these delicious and nutritious fruits, nuts, and seeds that we love as humans and that many other um, animals love as well. So pollination plays a very crucial role in ecosystems. Um, pollinators help to feed and house countless creatures, which can then help to feed and house countless other creatures within that same food web. Um, so and pollinators are also important in playing a role in maintaining soil and water health. So our ecosystem and lots of ecosystems across our planet are dependent on these healthy and diverse pollinator populations. So thinking again from our perspective as humans, thinking back to that one in every three bites of food uh, being created by a pollinator, uh, we can think of our grocery stores kind of as a good example of how our day-to-day -day lives would be impacted. So this is what our grocery stores typically tend to look like. Uh, we've got lots of different produce choices. You can see there's apples, raspberries, and blueberries, some oranges and other citrus, avocados, um, a lot of different choices, lots of different colors and options for produce. And this is what our produce choices in our grocery stores would look like without bees and other pollinators. A lot of those foods that we really like um, would disappear and we would not have the chance to eat them. So to look at some specifics, some of our favorite foods that we are reliant upon, uh, we're gonna go through a couple slides that are part of our um, pollinator toolkit. This is an activity called the pollinator plates um, that we use for education. So if there were no pollinators, what would be left in this cup of coffee? I know coffee is a staple in a lot of our lives. A lot of us wake up every morning and have a cup of coffee. But if we had no more pollinators, uh, we would be left with about three quarters of a cup of coffee. So coffee flowers can do some self-pollination. So the flowers are able to sort of fertilize themselves on their own, but insect pollinators improve production of coffee by about 25%. Uh, so without the insect pollinators, we would obviously have less coffee, but it would also increase the price of coffee, which would also impact our lives quite a bit. What about pizza? It's another thing that um, is a staple in a lot of our diets, something we look forward to eating. Um, this pizza in particular, we've got the crust, uh, that red tomato sauce, some cheese and tomatoes and green peppers as the toppings. And without pollinators, we would have a very sad looking pizza. Uh, we would have just the crust and a little bit of cheese. Um, so tomatoes uh, do need insect pollinators. They're pollinated by something uh, called buzz pollination that is very commonly done by bumblebees. So the bumblebees are able to fly inside that flower 
and they vibrate their bodies at a certain frequency that shakes the pollen, um, allowing that tomato flower to be pollinated. So without bumblebees or other bees that can do buzz pollination, tomato growers have to do this process by hand um, using something like an electric toothbrush that can shake the pollen out at that right frequency. Um, pepper flowers um, also need insect pollinators uh, in order to produce a lot of peppers. And then cheese. Um, so cheese is dairy, so it's made from milk. Um, but cows, a lot of the foods that cows consume, like alfalfa, um, is pollinated by insects. So if the cows are not getting enough food, then they're going to produce less milk, which means we will have less cheese. Um, and then we would still have our crust because wheat uh, is a grain and grains are wind pollinated. Then one more example here. Um, I know, especially in the summertime on a really hot day, it's really nice to bite into a big juicy strawberry. Um, these are something I totally look forward to eating when they're in season. But if there were no pollinators, we would be left with just a few strawberries and they would be sort of weird and misshapen. Um, so strawberry flowers are sort of able to pollinate themselves, um, but without the help from insect pollinators, um, the flowers are not sort of com pollinated completely, which results in these smaller, oddly shapen fruits. Um, so again, insect pollinators really help to make strawberry pollination um, more efficient, and then we have as many strawberries as we want to eat. So while we're mostly focusing on bees today, I wanted to touch on some of the other insect pollinators that you might see around um, that are also important uh, in our ecosystems. <laughs> so first we have bees, um, which are considered the most efficient pollinators because they are able to move more pollen than any of the other pollinators. This is a photo of a leaf cutter bee, um, and you can see she's totally covered in pollen. She's got a lot of pollen collecting hairs on the underside of her abdomen. Um, and that is what allows bees to be so efficient is their bodies are really hairy. So they're able to carry all of this pollen with them as they're visiting from one flower to the next. And the process of pollination is somewhat accidental in a way because bees collect pollen to feed to their young. So they're visiting these flowers to gather their resources um, to care for themselves and for their young. Uh, they're not necessarily going there with the goal of pollinating flowers. Um, it's just sort of something that happens um, as, I guess, kind of by accident as they're trying to support themselves. Uh, we also have flies, which are not as efficient pollinators as bees are because their bodies are not as hairy, um, but they have really high population numbers, which can make them really important pollinators. And sometimes they could be attracted to flowers that smell like rotting meat or dung, uh, things that bees and other insect pollinators might not necessarily be attracted to. This fly in this image here is one that we consider a bee mimic uh, because it's got similar black and yellow colors to a bee. Um, these are super common. You see them, once you know what to look for, you'll probably start to notice them a lot in your gardens. Um, but there's a couple ways that we can know that it is a fly rather than a bee. Uh, the first of those being its wings. Um, flies only have one set of wings, whereas bees have two sets of wings, and flies tend to hold their wings kind of directly out to the sides of them when they're visiting a flower, whereas a lot of bees will sort of neatly tuck their wings in and hold them over their backs while they're, they're gathering pollen and nectar. Flies also have these ginormous eyes that take up most of their head. If you think of the characteristics of a housefly and how they have those really humongous eyes. Um, it's similar for these uh, bee mimics as well. And then our, our flies also have very, very short antenna that sort of stick out from the middle of their face. Uh, bees have longer elbowed antenna, um, so that's another key difference to look out for. Then we also have butterflies and moths. Uh, butterflies and moths are also important pollinators because they can move pollen really great distances. The monarch butterfly is a good example of this. Um, we have the monarch butterflies that we see here in Minnesota migrate down in Mexico. So they travel very great distances to get there um, and they're able to move pollen a lot farther than a bee or a fly might. 
Wasps are also important pollinators. And I know a lot of people probably aren't crazy about that idea because wasps have kind of a negative reputation, um, but they are still important pollinators. They are not necessarily as efficient as um, bees or uh, because their bodies aren't as hairy, um, but they are still important pollinators. And they also provide a natural pest control. Um, wasps feed um, smaller insects to their young and these insects that they consume are often things that we consider common garden pests. Um, so the wasps, by eating these uh, smaller insects, are providing sort of a natural pest control in our gardens. <laughs> then we also have beetles, birds, and bats. Beetles were among some of the first insects to pollinate flowers about 140 million years ago. Uh, this is a picture of a goldenrod soldier beetle. These are super, super common in Minnesota. Um, you see them a lot in the late summer into the early fall, very often on goldenrod. Birds can be pollinators as well, um, like hummingbirds, for example. Um, bird pollinated flowers in Minnesota are very often red and don't have very strong scents. And then bats can be pollinators as well. Uh, we do not have any bat pollinators in Minnesota, but they can be important in deserts or tropical areas. So shifting gears back to bees. Um, very often when I talk about bees with a group of people, there's a stereotypical image in their head of something that's got yellow and black stripes that's really big and really fuzzy. And very often what they are thinking of are bumblebees, which are very valuable pollinators. Um, some species of bumblebees are very common. We see them a lot. Um, they're used um, in different images. You know, you see pictures of bumblebees all the time. But bumblebees actually only represent 1.4% of the over 3,600 known bee species in the United States. Uh, so it's important that we talk about the other 98.6% of bees that are making up the rest of that diversity. So here in Minnesota um, and in other parts of the US, we have bumblebees, like I said, we also have digger bees, mason bees, carpenter bees, and leaf cutter bees, just to name a few. I wanna stop and highlight the leaf cutter bee um, as an example, because they're one of my favorite species. I think they can be a little bit adorable sometimes. That photo in the bottom right-hand corner in particular, I think is a really cute image of a leaf cutter bee. Um, but this is a fairly common type of native bee that we, we see across Minnesota. They're generally moderate to large in size, about half the size to one and a half times the size of a honeybee, for example. They're very often black with thin white bands of hair running along their abdomens. Um, and they've got lots of those pollen collecting hairs on the underside of their abdomen. That photo all the way to the left of the leaf cutter bee visiting that purple flower. You can see lots of pollen uh, that she's got there. These bees are stem nesters and they are solitary. So this means that they live on their own. Um, they'll lay a few eggs and sort of leave those like eggs to mature on their own. Um, they don't live in a colony and take care of each other like honeybees do, for example. And the leafcutter bee also has, they have relatively large heads to support these really big, strong mandibles or jaws. Um, and that plays back to their name of leafcutter bees. They use these big, strong jaws to actually cut leaves. They will cut uh, little pieces of leaves um, off of different plants to use in their nests. Um, so if you ever see a flower stem with the leaves that have like perfectly round holes cut out of them, there's a chance that those were made by leaf cutter bees. And our list does not stop at leaf cutter bees. We've got yellow face bees, cellophane bees, minor bees, longhorn bees, and sweat bees to name a few more species. Um, another one that I'd like to highlight is the green metallic sweat bee. So this is another fairly common species in Minnesota. And I like to highlight it because um, when I first started working with bees, I had seen these a lot and I had no idea that they were bees um, because they're green, but bees can be lots and lots of different colors. Um, and the green metallic color makes these stand out and makes them fairly easy to identify. 
um, this particular species, the females have that green metallic color on their head and thorax, and then black and white stripes along their abdomen. And as their name suggests, um, these bees are actually attracted to human sweats. Um, they use our sweats uh, as sort of a source of nutrition. They're, they're trying to get the salt out of it. Uh, so during the summer, it's not uncommon to see one of these land on you on a hot day and kind of just hang out there uh, as it's trying to, to get some of those resources out of your sweats. Um, the green metallic sweat bee is a ground nesting species of bee. So these bees nest in the ground. And this species in particular um, is not solitary like, like the leaf cutter bee, but it's not quite social like a honey bee. Um, either. We consider this particular species of bee to be communal. So many females might share one nest entrance, so one hole in the ground where lots of them will be going in. Uh, but within that hole, they each have their own sort of cavity or tunnel where they lay their own eggs. Um, they don't care for the eggs of the other bees uh, within that same nest entrance. <laughs> So let's do a poll here. Um, how many species of bees do we have here in Minnesota? Um, 25, 50, 500, or 5,000? We'll give everyone just a couple seconds to go ahead and uh, put in your guess. All right. So here in Minnesota, we have 508 different species of native bees. Uh, to be exact, we've got 24 different types of bumblebees just to kind of show um, the breadth of that diversity. And that translates to about 4,000 different species across North America and about 20,000 different species of bees worldwide. Um, so if, if you just think back to that initial um, point that I was making about bumblebees, you know how they're very often sort of that stereotypical image. Um, next time you think about bees, try and think about the sweat bees and the leaf cutter bees and the bees that make up all these different colors uh, because it, they're a very diverse population. So if there are so many different types of bees, why is it so important that we talk about each of these individual species? Aldo Leopold said to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. Each individual species of bees sort of represents one cog in the wheel of any ecosystem. And making sure that all of those different moving parts are okay um, helps to ensure that the entire ecosystem is healthy. So bees come in different shapes and sizes and nutritional needs. Um, our bumblebee here on the left is much, much larger than the little green metallic sweat bee on the right. Um, the bumblebee is a social species that is making sure to gather enough resources to support a colony where the sweat bee is just caring for a couple of eggs. Um, and because they have different sizes, they will visit different types of flowers. So paying attention to this diversity is really relevant uh, in taking our different actions to support pollinators. <clears throat> So how are all of these different pollinators doing, um, all of our 508 different species in Minnesota? So some pollinator populations we know are unfortunately declining. Others are still appearing to be stable. But for the majority of our pollinator populations, we actually don't know how they're doing. So bumblebees, um, again, a very charismatic species that a lot of people think of when they think of bees are unfortunately a species that we are concerned about. About one in every three species of bumblebee um, is at risk or facing some threat of extinction. Uh, the rusty patch bumblebee is an example of this. It was once a very common species and is now um, critically endangered and facing extinction. So prior to the year 2000, uh, this is where the rusty patch bumblebee could be found. 
Um, it was one of the most common types of bumblebees across the eastern U.S. Uh, we found them in Minnesota, all the way up to Maine, into a little bit of Canada, and down all the way to Georgia. So lots and lots of states where rusty patch bumblebees were being found. And this is the current range of the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, so it's mostly found in parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin, a little bit into Iowa and Illinois, and a few uh, sightings have been made of rusty patch bumblebee onto uh, the rest of the East Coast. And most of these observations have sort of been in urban areas around the Twin Cities, but this range is greatly reduced compared to what we were seeing prior to the year 2000. So another poll here, honeybees at risk of extinction, yes or no? All right. Honeybees are not at risk of extinction. Their populations are not declining. Um, so honeybees are actually not native to the United States at all. They were brought over here from Europe uh, to be used as a part of agriculture. And while they are prone to a lot of health problems um, and parasites like the Varroa mites, um, their colony numbers are still remaining stable. And we have beekeepers that look after honeybees um, to help raise more bees and attend to all of these different health problems. So what about monarch butterflies? Are they in decline or fine? Monarch butterflies are unfortunately another species of pollinator that are declining. Um, they have declined pretty rapidly over the last 25 years. Um, this is looking at survey data from the Xerces Society. Uh, so this is looking at the western, the western population of the monarch butterfly. So this is uh, west of the Rocky Mountains. Um, but you can see uh, the number of sites monitored is shown with, on that blue line on the graph. So this, the number of sites monitored is increasing, but the total number of monarchs reported, which is those green bars on the graph, that um, has decreased quite a bit over the last 25 years. So this is another species of pollinator that we are unfortunately still concerned about. And there's not necessarily one driving force behind these declines of these different species of pollinators. Um, they're facing quite a few different challenges um, like habitat loss and poor nutrition, so a lack of diverse flowers. And then outside factors like climate change, um, the use of pesticides, the spread of pathogens and parasites are all factors that are impacting pollinators. And these different factors are sort of interacting in ways that are making the damage um, even more significant and harmful to our different native pollinators. So with that, let's talk about our four actions that we can take to help uh, fight against uh, these different factors that are causing declines um, and some of the ways that we can support these different pollinators. So our first action to help pollinators is planting flowers. Um, and there's a few things that sort of come along with planting flowers. Uh, you want to sort of plant flowers that are blooming sequentially. So you wanna have something that's blooming in the early spring, the late spring, um, into the summer, late summer, early fall and late fall. So there's always a different option uh, for the different bees that might be emerging at that time of year. Um, it's also important to keep these flowers free of pesticides. So that includes fungicides and insecticides as pesticides are one of the um, things that are causing pollinator declines. Uh, so planting flowers is very important. Um, when, when it comes to planting for pollinators, we kind of like to tell people to sort of take a choose your own adventure approach. Um, but native flowers can offer, off, often offer the best nutrition uh, for our native bees. Um, 
So flowers that have not sort of been mo modified or curated or cultivated to look a certain way, to have a certain aesthetic value, those unmodified native plants are going to offer the best nutrition uh, for different types of bees and other pollinators. Um, we also have some different types of bees in Minnesota that are specialists. Uh, this means that these bees um, specialize on a specific type of flower. So they're getting all of their pollen and nectar from either one family or a uh, group of flowers. Um, the bee on the left, this is a type of longhorned bee. Um, these bees specialize on sunflowers. So that means that they are only visiting sunflowers uh, to get their nutritional resources. Um, the bee on the right, this is a mining bee that specializes on goldenrod. So they are going to be only visiting goldenrod to get those um, resources. So when planting for pollinators, thinking about planting flowers, another thing that you might want to consider is planting to cater to these specialist bees, um, particularly specialist bees that might be um, in decline or lacking these resources elsewhere. There's a lot of different pollinator plant lists um, that can help you determine what might be the right plants to put in your landscape. Um, things that we've created at the Bee Lab, um, lists from people like Heather Holm and the Xerces Society uh, that can help you make decisions. And with that, I wanna just quickly talk about a resource that we at the Bee Squad developed over the last year and a half or so. Um, we created a resource on planting for pollinators. So it's essentially an online interactive decision-making tool that guides you through lots of different resources. Um, part of the motivation in creating this tool is that there's so much information out there, but it can be very difficult to find and it can be hard to know what's right for you and your landscape. Um, so our tool guides you through the different uh, types of pollinator plantings, um, guides that can help you make an assessment of your landscape, um, some of the things you should do to plan for planting for pollinators, and how to um, keep up with the maintenance of your pollinator habitat. There's also resources on our tool uh, about um, the different types of financial support uh, that can be offered to um, homeowners or farmers um, in creating pollinator habitat, information about pesticides, and then we have a glossary of terms because this stuff can get confusing and sometimes big words can get thrown around and we wanted a place where everything could be defined. So I'm going to open up the tour of the tool here and sort of give you a virtual tour of it. Um, so the tool is available on our Bee Lab website, beelab.umn.edu/slash plant flowers. So when you get to this page, you click on the planting resources button, which then takes you to the interactive tool. So there's the different categories here: planting types, assessment guides, planning and practices, financial support, pesticide information, and glossary of terms. Uh, so we can go into planting types, for example, and we just picked a few that um, we get a lot of questions about and that are often um, the easiest for people to get started in. So we can take a look at pollinator garden, for example. Within the pollinator garden page, there's um, it gets even more specific. So we can just look at uh, today the general planting. So the, these are different guides um, that have lists of plants um, that might be suitable for your landscape. Um, so once you're into this part of the tool, there will be a little image that shows what the PDF looks like um, and a little explanation of it. And when you click on the open button, it then takes you to that resource. Um, but you can click through here, see there's resources from the Bee Lab, Board of Water and Soil Resources, um, Prairie Nursery, and Extension. So lots of different people that know a lot about different types of plants that might be suitable for different landscapes. You can also look at um, different plants that are suitable in pollinator gardens by region. Uh, so like looking at the Great Lakes region, Northern Plains, um, and other different parts of Minnesota. Our state is so diverse that some plants are more suitable for certain parts of the state than others. If we go back to our homepage here, 
um, we can take a look at some of these assessment guides. So these are things that sort of, they're tools that can help you make an assessment on how you're doing with the pollinator habitat that are, might that you might have already established uh, within your landscape and sort of give yourself a score and look into different ways that you can make improvements. Um, the financial support page. So the once you, when you get into here, um, you can look at the different types of funding. So there are things that are offered to homeowners, private or corporate lands, public lands, um, educational organizations, agricultural lands, and natural resource agencies. Um, so these are the different people that might benefit from these different types of financial support. So for homeowners, there's programs like Lawns to Legumes, um, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund also offers um, a program to help people out in getting started with planting some pollinator habitat, uh, pheasants forever, um, and so on. So there's a lot of different resources out there um, that can help you get started with planning uh, and getting started with the actual planting process for creating pollinator habitat. Um, as part of the um, resources that Tara is going to send out after this series, we have a feedback form. So if anybody is interested in looking more into this resource, um, diving into some of those PDFs that are included in the planting types, assessment guides, and so on, and letting us know kind of what you think about how the tool works and the resources that are included, it would be great if you could take a couple minutes to fill out that form uh, to give us an idea of uh, if you found it useful. All right, so jumping back into our actions to help pollinators. Um, our second action is providing homes. So bees need homes too. Um, habitat is crucial uh, in um, helping to support different types of bees. So we'll go ahead and do a pollinator trivia question. Where do most bees live? A, uh, in trees, B, in the ground, C, in plant stems, or D, in the grass? I'll give you guys a couple minutes to think about your answer. All right. So the correct answer, percent of bee species make their nests in the ground. So providing homes for ground nesting bees is very important. We think back earlier to those green metallic sweat bees. That's one type of ground nesting bees or one type of ground nesting bee. And providing homes for ground nesting bees is pretty easy. It's kind of one of those things where doing less is more. Um, leaving patches of dried leaves on the ground can create habitat for these bees. Um, keeping patches of bare soil that are both disturbed and undisturbed, so in different areas of your yard, um, can help to support these bees. And most ground nesting bees are not aggressive. Um, they're not necessarily super, super territorial species because they are very often solitary. So they're not looking after a large colony. So they're bees that we want to have um, in our gardens and in our landscapes. Another type of home that we can provide are cavity nests. So a lot of social bees um, here in Minnesota and across the rest of the country um, nest in hollow cavities. So these are like hollow plant stems or um, cavities that they find in logs or stumps. Um, so adding a log or a stump to your garden or a corner of your yard um, is a way that you can support these cavity nesting bees, um, as well as leaving some stems when cutting back perennials and shrubs. And um, the process of creating stem nesting bees from uh, perennials and shrubs um, takes about um, a year and a half or so. Um, and it sort of starts in the winter time when you leave dead flower stalks standing over the winter. 
Then in the spring, uh, you cut back those dead flower stalks. So you're cutting off the top of those flowers and you're leaving behind the stem stubble. And you can leave it for a, a various heights. So anywhere between eight and 24 inches to provide different size nest cavities uh, for different types of bees. So female bees will find these cut or naturally broken off stems to start their nests. Uh, they'll go into the cavity uh, where they will create a pollen ball and then lay an egg on that pollen ball. And as that larva is maturing, um, it is eating that pollen that that female bee left behind. As we move into the summer, uh, those perennial plants will produce new growth that kind of hides that uh, stem stubble that you left standing. And uh, within that stem stubble, the bee larvae are developing uh, throughout that growing season. And as we move into the fall and winter, those bees in those stems are hibernating. Uh, they're kind of just hanging out there um, as it's cold, waiting for their time to emerge. And then in the spring, uh, that's when the adult emerging uh, from the, the stem stubble where they had been hibernating. Um, that stem stubble will decompose. You can sort of start the process over again, cutting back the flower stalks. Um, and those newly emerged adult bees will begin that process over where they are looking for a place to create a nest. So they might pick that, uh, those flower stalks that you just cut off, they might pick those cavities to nest in or find other naturally occurring ones in your landscape. Um, this how to create habitat for stem nesting bees is another resource that we developed at the Bee Lab um, that will be shared with all of the resources from this presentation. Another type of bee that we want to be providing homes for are bumblebees. Um, bumblebees nest in a variety of places. Some of them will nest just below the surface of the ground. Some of them will nest on the surface of the ground. Um, in urban areas, you might find bumblebees um, in places like abandoned birdhouses, um, old rodent nests, um, and even like backyard patio furniture. They might find a way to nest in there. Um, but to provide bumblebees with some sort of natural habitat um, within your landscape, you want to leave piles of dried grasses and sticks in undisturbed corners. Messy corners, well, they don't necessarily fit the typical aesthetic of um, a lawn or garden are really great for bumblebees to create nests um, as well as other types of wildlife as well. Um, so the Habitat Assessment Guide for Pollinators in Yards, Gardens, and Parks that was developed by the Xerces Society um, and people here at the University of Minnesota. Um, this is one that is in our uh, planting resources tool. This is a really great um, guide for creating um, habitat for different types of bees. So it allows you to sort of score your sites on the different types of habitat that you've created. And you can look through the resource um, to understand how you can sort of improve that site that you have started to create. So our third action in our four actions to help pollinators is taking climate action. Um, climate change greatly impacts pollinators. Um, they are losing habitat due to climate change. Climate change is increasing the frequency of extreme weather events. Um, it's causing rain shifts. So plants are sort of shifting their ranges to find uh, environments that are more suitable to their needs. Um, insects might be shifting their ranges as well as they're looking for more suitable climates. Um, and this is causing pollinators to sometimes not have uh, the types of plants that they need. Um, so th there are a lot of different ways that climate change is impacting pollinators. And taking climate action looks like doing things um, such as using cleaner energy sources, uh, planting trees and grasslands, supporting sustainable agriculture practices, and supporting environmental regulations. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can support pollinators um, by taking these steps to climate action. Um, climate action can be something that happens in our gardens and landscapes, so tying back to that first action of planting flowers. Um, planting 
flowers that are tolerant in a changing climate can really benefit pollinators. Um, so willows are an example of something that bloom in the early spring. So they can be that first uh, sign of food or the first resources of pollen and nectar that pollinators have in the early spring. Um, and they're also a flood tolerant species. So as I mentioned, extreme weather events are becoming a lot more common with climate change, um, like floods. So planting things like willows that are tolerant of these floods um, gives pollinators resources uh, when other plants might not be surviving these extreme weather events. Asters are another climate tolerant plant that blooms in the late summer. Um, so again, we want to have resources for pollinators that are blooming all season long, early spring to late summer into the fall. Asters are a great example of that. And they are a plant that is very drought tolerant. Um, so droughts really impact pollinators um, because they have such an impact on flowers. Um, but planting things like asters that are drought tolerant um, is another great way to take climate action, particularly in your garden. And our fourth and final action uh, to support pollinators is collecting data. So this is something that we like to refer to um, as community science or participatory science, um, but members of the public gathering data that can be used by scientists to help us understand what's going on within different pollinator populations. The Monarch Larva Monitoring Project um, is run by the Monarch Joint Venture, uh, where volunteers uh, work to count monarch eggs and caterpillars on milkweed plants and then report it back to the scientists at Monarch Joint Venture uh, so they can understand more about monarch breeding, biology, and distribution across all of North America. There are also um, uh, what we like to consider biodiversity portals like iNaturalist um, that are really great for gathering data. Um, iNaturalist is an app that you can download. Um, it's fairly easy to use. You can snap a photo of pollinators, um, different types of plants. You can also put different mammals um, and observations up onto iNaturalist. Uh, but iNaturalist sort of records the location where you made that observation and it helps us understand where different species are being found, um, what types of bees might be found visiting what different types of plants and uh, how commonly these things are happening um, and across what parts of the state. Um, the Minnesota Bee Atlas um, is a project that looks at native bees. So all of the observations of native bees that are uploaded to iNaturalist are sort of funneled into that project and it's helping us understand where these different species are being found. So this data is really used by scientists and it is really valuable because a big group of members of the public can gather a lot more data than just a couple scientists can over the course of one season. Um, Bumblebee Watch um, is another one of those biodiversity portals. Uh, it is fairly similar to iNaturalist, but is, it is just for bumblebees. Um, and sightings of bumblebees are verified and identified by experts. And again, this data is used by scientists. Um, I am a big fan of Bumblebee Watch because it is the biodiversity portal that we use for the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas, uh, which is a project that I help to coordinate. Um, so this is a community science project that anybody is welcome to, support, to participate in. Um, requirements include time, transportation, a camera, internet access and passion for insects. So most people, um, if not all people are welcome to participate in this project. And we are focused on tracking and conserving our bumblebees here in Minnesota. So I'll just really briefly run through how to participate in this program since this is a really great way to help collect data for that fourth action to help pollinators. Um, but volunteers in this program adopt a grid cell so they're adopting one of these squares in within our state of Minnesota where they're going out to do surveys for bumblebees. Uh, we require them to take a training um, so, they, so they're knowing, I guess, kind of what to look for, um, how to safely handle bees. Um, they have, they, we require a few supplies like uh, vials for collecting bees, a net, a cooler, um, and the data sheets. You want to make a plan so you're picking a location within that grid cell where you're going out to do a survey for bumblebees 
Um, and this is another great thing about this program and about a lot of other community science programs is it's a great chance to connect with other people who are passionate about similar things that you are passionate about. Um, we have a Facebook group for our Bumblebee Atlas volunteers. Um, and there's a lot of really great interactions, people sharing awesome photos that they've gotten during their surveys, asking questions about um, different types of bees they saw, um, what types of things they can plant in their gardens if they want to see more bumblebees um, and things like that. So bumblebee surveys uh, that you do as part of the Bumblebee Atlas um, take 45 minutes uh, where you're going out and capturing bees um, off of flowers. So our volunteers use little sort of Tupperware containers where they're going out and capturing bees off of flowers. Bees get put into a cooler. Um, the ice is sort of like an anesthetic. It kind of puts them to sleep. So they slow down enough so you can get photographs of them. Um, once the bees have been photographed, then they can be released. So no bees are harmed uh, during these surveys. Um, and we also ask our volunteers to gather habitat data. So they're taking a look at what's going on um, uh, on the site where they're at, uh, what types of plants are blooming, um, what types of management practices might be done and things like that. And the Bumblebee Atlas has helped us determine a lot about bumblebees in Minnesota. Um, so we're still working on analyzing our 2023 data, but in 2021 and 2022, there were uh, nearly 7,000 observations of bumblebees made. Um, 49 different grids adopted, so 49 different areas within our state were surveyed, and we documented 18 out of our 24 species of bumblebees. So we're getting a really good idea of where these different species are being found um, and what plants they might prefer. So to kind of revisit here the different types of um, actions that can be taken to help pollinators, the first is plant flowers and planting diverse flowers to support a diverse variety of pollinators. Um, and then keeping those uh, pollinator foods pesticide free. Um, our second action is making sure that uh, these pollinators have places to live. So making sure that they have adequate habitat and places to nest. Um, gathering data to inform scientists about uh, what's going on with the different pollinator populations, um, and then our climate action uh, action as well um, that ties back into uh, planting for pollinators in a way that um, supports pollinators in a changing climate. So we will wrap up here with one final pollinator trivia question. True or false? Teaching others about pollinators is a great start to help pollinator conservation. So this is true. Uh, talking to your family, your friends, your neighbors, and your coworkers about how they can help pollinators um, is a great way to get started in pollinator conservation. Um, if you are an educator or you know somebody that is an educator uh, looking to do more activities about pollinators, um, we developed these pollinator education toolkits. Those pollinator plates that slides that we did early on in this presentation are part of this, this educational tool. Um, but this is available on our website on the Pollinator Ambassadors page. Uh, we have both a virtual version and physical copies of the tool that you can order online. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. Um, I hope that you learned something about the different actions that we can take to help pollinators. And we've got a little bit of time now for some questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elise, for a great job presenting and, and really helping us understand how each one of us can take practical steps towards supporting pollinators in our, in our own communities. Uh, we have a lot of questions on the docket for you. Thankfully, Claire and Shane have been helping answer those in the background, but we did want to save a few for um, generally, uh, I think would be applicable for the, the general population. So the first one is, do you know how many bee species have been lost in Minnesota? Mm, specific numbers, I don't know. Um, this kind of ties back into what I was saying about how for a lot of pollinators, 
we don't necessarily know what's going on with their populations. Um, some bees emerge for very short periods of time. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of data that needs to be gathered within that short amount of time when they are out. And we don't always have enough people to gather that information. So a lot of these po pollinator populations, we're not really sure what's going on with. And I, off the top of my head, am not sure how many Minnesota specific species we have lost. But thanks to your tips, we can minimize that hopefully um, yeah. in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have a couple about the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, so some folks were pointing out that the greatest number of rusty patch bumblebees are found in like the Twin Cities or the Chicago metro areas. Um, is there some reason that they congregate in urban areas or is it more just the natural, like the there's more people that are more cognizant of these bees. What, what is your take on that? Sure. So I like that this person commented on the iNaturalist observations, um, because when you go into iNaturalist and look at the bumblebees that are observed, rusty patch bumblebee is one of the top um, observations that of bumblebees, you know, because when people see one, they're more likely to upload a photo of it um, than they are other species of bees. Um, so while sort of the frequency of observation of rusty patch bumblebees may not necessarily be representative of how common a species they are, um, it is true that we are finding them mostly in the Twin Cities and other sort of urban areas. Um, and we're not really sure why this is happening. It's kind of just a, a guess that there is, they have some preference towards urban areas um, and more urban types of habitat as opposed to um, agricultural or more rural settings. Um, so that's something we're kind of still hoping to understand a little bit more about in terms of rusty patch bumblebee habitat preferences. And kind of going off of that, do you know what happened in about the year 2000 that resulted in that significant reduction in the rusty patch bumblebee numbers? So again, we are not exactly sure what happened. There's a lot of different guesses as to what might have caused this decline. Um, but one of the most common guesses is that there is some disease or pathogen that impacted this species in particular. Um, there is another type of bumblebee, um, the yellow banded bumblebee, which is Bombus terricola, that is also more closely related to the rusty patch bumblebee that has also experienced a fairly significant decline that also started around the same time. Um, so, the guess for a lot of people is that um, it is some sort of with some sort of pathogen or something, but we're not exactly sure what caused that. On to a different topic: to rake or not to rake fall leaves. Is it important to leave the leaves where they fall? Is it effective or as effective to pile them in a desirable location while raking other areas? What are your thoughts? This is a great question. So leaving leaves um, is a great way to provide nesting habitat for lots of different native bees and overwintering bumblebees as well. So bumblebees have an annual life cycle. Only the queens survive the winter and they'll dig themselves a couple of inches underground to um, sort of hibernate. And having these uh, a layer of leaves or a pile of leaves um, is a great way to provide overwintering bumblebees um, with habitat as well as other bees that might nest in the ground over the winter. Um, and again, this is something that we sort of like to say, choose your own adventure. There are benefits to sort of leaving a thin layer of leaves across one part of um, your garden or landscape. Um, you might want to pick a different corner where you leave a pile. Um, you can also use those leftover leaves as sort of a mulch um, in the spring. Um, but yes, leaving leaves can really impact um, bees in a positive way when it comes to creating habitat for them. And kind of on that, you know, the similar topic of mulch, how much gardening and landscaping would disturb these ground nesting bees? Is shallow tilling okay? What about a deep mulch? Um, that's a good question. And I think it kind of depends on the species. Um, because different species have different preferences. Some species prefer soils that have sort of already been tilled or mulched 
um, they might prefer to nest in those areas um, where others like totally undisturbed ground um, that has no mulch or anything on top of it. Um, so kind of having a variety of those different things is sort of the best way to support these different types of bees. And going into more of the stem side of things, how early in, in the spring should we cut back the stems? Can you cut back the first year stalks after the second year flowers? Like how long do you keep them up? We had a couple of questions on that. Sure. So um, the best time to cut back um, those flower stalks is I think I would, I would I think before they start blooming or producing that new growth. So fairly early on in the season is usually okay. Um, and then you'll want to leave that, that stem stubble up for, for at least one full season for those bees in there to sort of complete their life cycle. Um, and this is something you want to do with perennial plants. So they're kind of sort of on their own timeline, you know, you'll cut back parts of it, but the plant will still produce sort of its own um, new growth. Um, did that and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting if there was another part to that question. Just everything about stems. What is the best best management practices for stems? Yeah, I definitely recommend following um, that resource we have on habitats for stem nesting bees because um, it sort of breaks down um, the timeline for that a little bit more clearly. Um, and there's also a list of plants on that resource as well um, that. Um, are, so those the, the list of plants includes plants that have those hollow stems that would be suitable for cavity nesting bees. Do you know if one cover is better than the others? Like I've uh, one of these questions, it says, you know, the leaf litter, the untrimmed native grasses, the shrubby and herbaceous ground covers, or is it more of a comprehensive, just all of them to uh, to have a home for the pollinators? Yep, I think, again, this is another case where variety can be great. Um, you know, we think about the different specialist bees and how bees are lots of different shapes and sizes. And we want it when we're, we want to be planting a diversity of flowers. We also want to be providing different types of bees with a diversity of habitat. So having these different options in terms of ground covering, um, you might be able to attract lots of different types of ground nesting bees as opposed to maybe just one or two. Do you know, and maybe this might be a question for Dr. Lane tomorrow, but do you know about anything about uh, the warm weather or the warm winter that we've been having and, and its effects on pollinators this year? Um, definitely something we should talk to Elaine about tomorrow because she'll she'll be able to answer a little bit more clearly than I will. But, you know, there is a certain I mean, when we're seeing these really extremes, we're always concerned about climate change. But we know that things fluctuate from year to year. Some winters are warmer than others. Um, and po pollinator populations also kind of fluctuate up and down. So it's hard, I guess, to know um, if. Uh, how sort of, or I guess, what kind of impacts this is going to have on pollinators, but definitely something we should follow up with Elaine tomorrow. That's a hint for all of you to join us for the next two days, <laughs> especially if we don't get to all of these questions, make sure to um, put these in the chat tomorrow or Thursday, because a lot of these will be great for our speakers, Dr. Elaine Evans and uh, Marisha Shu on Thursday. So if we don't get to everything, that's okay. We'll get to it at some point. Um, the next one, is there any effort to use highway medians and roadsides as pollinator habitat? Um, there is some effort. I think that this is something that um, is decided kind of based on different cities or counties. Um, but I know that there are certain cities that are trying to make an effort to plant pollinator habitat in those right of way areas, um, because they're often sort of unused space um, that can is otherwise you know not necessarily serving a huge purpose um, so I think there has been sort of a movement or initiation of that kind of idea in the last few years um another one and this is kind of a, a, a overall question that I, I've seen a lot is how to go about um, asking um, questions about what neighbors are spraying or what municipalities are spraying, 
do you, does the B lab have any resources in terms of asking those questions, handling that, um, any type of like helpful conversation starters? Yeah, I think something that can be really helpful with that before even talking to your neighbors um, is the idea of cues to care or having a sign in your pollinator habitat. So having a sign that says like, this is pollinator friendly habitat, pesticides are not used here. Um, something along those lines that kind of lets your neighbors know that, well, the choices you're making in your landscape may not necessarily fit the most common or typical aesthetic that people look for in gardens. They are still choices that you've made intentionally with a goal of supporting our ecosystems and supporting our pollinators. Um, and sometimes that signage um, can be uh, a really great conversation starter um, with you or your neighbors. Um, I know my parents have a really huge pollinator garden and um, my mom has gotten in touch with um, the uh, lawn care services that my neighbors use rather than going directly to my to their neighbors um she's contacted the lawn cares and just said hey this is what we're what we're doing here in our landscape we would appreciate if you make sure that you're not mowing into my lawn or something like that and kind of giving people an explanation of why you're making those choices can sort of help it be a little bit easier for people to understand Perfect. That That is a reoccurring question, and that's probably a question I'll be asking Elaine and Marissa. I think it's it's not a really nice, easy answer. So I think just anything, um, any resources that that anyone can use is, is definitely appreciative, and, and the B-Lab is a great go-to resource for that. So um, let's go on to, there's a ton of questions, so I'm just trying to make sure that we're doing a good use of our time. Um, do you know how the effect uh, of the drought has, um, how the drought has affected the region for pollinators? Have, has anyone talked about that in the bee lab? Um, I don't know that we've talked about like what's happened in the last few years specifically. Um, but in general, droughts do have impacts on pollinators, um, because they have impacts on flowers. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, Probably all I would have to say about that specifically. Claire and Shane, have you seen any um, decreases in pollinators due to the drought across your locations? That's a great question. I Anna, and this is all anecdotal, um, but generally during hot, dry periods, we might get more calls about wasps. And that may not be because of the drought per se, um, but it may be because of the lack of water and you might see them more in places where people are, right? That they may be bringing out their food or drinks or they're at a pool or, or someplace where there's water and there's people. And a lot of times you might see more of a certain type of insect. So um, I'm always kind of conscious of that. So it's hard for me to say, yes, uh, I saw more or yes, I saw fewer. Um, but that's kind of what runs in my head uh, when I think about that question but nothing super duper strong. Now I've seen a lot fewer s Japanese beetles in my area, which is nice. Uh, but uh, I, I don't, I didn't think I saw any big tra changes for the bees in my neck of the woods, but I'm just a data point. Claire, any thoughts? I was going to say uh, exactly the same thing as far as uh, seemingly to have more wasp questions this year. Uh, so maybe something there. And then we're seeing, you know, strong correlations like Shane mentioned that on drought years, we have less emergence of Japanese beetles. So, yep. Thank you. Um, and kind of along that same line, should we be putting out water for our pollinators? And if so, what is the best way to do so? Um, so you totally can put out a bee bath, like a bird bath. Um, this particularly will benefit honeybees. I'm not exactly sure as to how it benefits other native bees, but bees do need water too. Um, the difference between a bee bath and a bird bath is that a bird can sort of stand on the edge and lean over and get the water. Um, 
bees can't do that. They need it to be very shallow with some sort of rock or something that they're able to kind of stand on as they're getting the water out of it. But yeah, people do totally put out bee baths um, to give bees water. They need it too. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, does the bee lab have a sign that is already made up about not spraying by chance? We don't have a sign um, for like pesticide use. Um, there are a few other signs that we're working on getting in the bookstore right now. Um, one that just talks, it says bees need homes too, um, and just has some examples of the different like types of nesting habitat. And then we have a rusty patch bumblebee one. Um, but we don't have one that is specifically about not using pesticides. Um, the Xerxes Society does have a really great pollinator habitat sign that we sometimes will direct people towards. Perfect. Um, there's one question that said uh, he learned about sprays that are bee safe and based off of honeybees, but not the smaller native bees or ground nesting bees. Do you know anything about the, the different effects of uh, insecticides on different types of bees? Um, I know that most of the research that is done um, on pesticides is very often looking into honeybees um, because honeybees can be so much easier to study than native bees. You know, they live in these big colonies. They are out for the entire season. They live through the winter, whereas a lot of our native bees have a lifespan of like one to two weeks or a couple months. Um, and so it can be a little bit harder to understand the impacts on these um, other types of native bees specifically. Um, but generally, um, I'd say the impact of most pesticides um, on bees from what we understand is not good. <laughs> And yeah, even the ones that are considered to be safe um, can still sometimes have effects that we just don't quite understand yet. Uh, this question is, is specific to a pollinator specialist bee, but I, I think it's a good overall question is, what is the lifespan of a pollinator specialist bee? And the second question is kind of what pertains to all pollinators. And if they only feed on goldenrods and other specific plant, do they only live for a few weeks? Does the, does the lifespan correspond with the blooming of the flowers? Yes, it can. So yeah, some of these specialist bees can live for um, just a couple weeks. Um, they will emerge, you know, sort of around the same time that the plant they specialize in uh, will start to bloom. And then, they, you know, they live for their short, limited lifespan, which is often uh, shorter than the lifespan of the plant. Um, I like this question because it ties back into sort of that idea of taking climate action and how, um, these plant rain shifts that are being caused by climate change really affects these specialist bees, you know, so if a, a bee specializes on a particular plant that either ends up blooming early because of extreme weather events or shifts its range just a little bit and is growing in a slightly different area, um, that can make it really difficult for these specialist bees uh, to get the resources that they need in their very short lifespans. Thank you for that answer. I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put up your after uh, your end of presentation survey. And really, we have these questions really help us um, help Elise uh, with her presentation, but also um, it helps us determine what future uh, programs that we should focus on. So we'd really appreciate it if you can submit this poll. I'll, I'll, I'll leave this open while we're answering a few more questions, uh, but we really appreciate your feedback. Um, and let's go to a couple more questions. Let's see. I mowed my leaves last fall. Should I wait until springtime to do this? Kind of back on the leaves. Hmm. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest. Shane or Claire, yeah. any thoughts? I would, I, I don't know. I, 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 again, I would focus more on kind of making things messy. <laughs> I'm probably not the person to ask about um, mowing or raking lawns. I think there's, I, and there's good soil uh, impacts for keeping those leaves and things on your soil and, and in some cases mowing them, but yeah, I'm not, if it's, unless it's extremely thick, I don't know. I wouldn't have a good answer on that either. 
let's see, and this is kind of off the cuff, but are you, do you happen to be familiar with the idea that white turtle heads have a substance in them that kills parasites and bees? Any talk about that in the bee lab? I have not heard anything about that. That's interesting. Yeah. That might I be have a not question heard that. for me tomorrow. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, shouldn't the context about leaves also relate to the thickness of the leaf bed? If we have a tree that drops a lot of leaves, then wouldn't that suffocate the plants below? Um, that is another question that I don't necessarily know the answer to, um, because I think it kind of depends on like what plants might be growing beneath that tree, uh, what time of year they might be blooming, um, things like that. I think a lot yeah. of these are oh. Yeah, a lot of these are really, some of these are turf questions too. And, and we're, you know, there are some, and Frank brings up a good point that um, sometimes you may want something to be a tall grass prairie or something that, you know, when you're surrounded by deep, heavy shade and you're kind of in a woodland situation. And I would, I, at least I think you would agree that there are lots of pollinator plants that you could put in a woodland area, right. To get to our goals. You don't necessarily have to have a tall grass prairie everywhere. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a good point. You know, you got to work with your landscape a lot of times too. Totally. And that's kind of one of the goals with our, that planting resources tool we have um, is that not all landscapes are created equal. You know, we live, all of our urban areas look different, um, suburban, you know, there's, you are, everybody has different options in terms of what they can plant. And there's lots of different resources out there that are really specialized to the type of landscape that you might have. So if you have more of a wooded area, there are resources to find the right types of plants to be putting in the ground as opposed to something that's more suitable in like a tall grass prairie. Wonderful. I think all the rest of these are great questions for our upcoming speakers. So please keep these questions in mind uh, for Dr. Lane Evans and Marissa Shu on Wednesday and Thursday of this week. I think the last question I want to ask you, Elise, is do you have a favorite bee? Do I have a favorite bee? Well, I since I do so much work with bumblebees, I love bumblebees. Um, I do a lot of bumblebee surveys with Elaine and as part of the Bumblebee Atlas. Um, I like the like the green metallic sweat bee and the small carpenter bees. I like the bees that also don't look like bees because um, I think that they're really unique and kind of just representative of how um, diverse a species they are and how important they are as well. Very fun. Very fun. We'll see them hopefully soon. I mean, it feels like spring, so maybe we'll see them yeah. soon. Who knows? <laughs> um, but unless there was anything else, uh, Shane, Claire, unless there was anything else, no. um, we really appreciate you all joining us today. Thank you to the audience members for your great questions. A lot of these uh, we'll be talking about in the next upcoming days. So stay tuned. Uh, that wraps our, up our first session of Meet Your Pollinators webinar series. Thank you for participating with us today. Tomorrow's presentation will cover the topic of pollinator identification with Dr. Elaine Evans. And have a great afternoon, everyone. Enjoy the nice springy weather. <laughs> Thank you so much. Join us tomorrow.